worry, Alan, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> Guy, good afternoon. It's so good, good to afternoon. see you. You too. How are you? Huh? I'm, I'm doing fine, thank you. It's Yourself? Indeed, it's indeed a while, and um, I always love seeing you, hearing you speak and talking to you. Where are you today, Guy? Today I'm in our headquarters uh, in uh, near Lyon in Switzerland. Yeah. And uh, just left the design studio to come in and, uh, and talk with you guys since we have better reception in this room. And that way you also don't see all the latest designs on the walls and things, so, you know. Perfect. So I really, really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me. I know you're extremely busy. I know you guys had a double appointment book today with Frederic. So Frederic, thank you so much for letting Guy sit with me. Um, I'm very honored that you chose me over Frederic. So merci uh, beaucoup. Um, Guy, you are, in my humble opinion, I wrote on my Instagram yesterday, one of the most modest guys in the watch industry. And one of the, I wouldn't say underrated designers, but I think you're one of the best watch designers out there today. So I'm a huge fan of your work. I've, uh, I know you for quite some time. Um, had the honor to hold many different pieces that you've designed. I'm super happy you're at Tegoria today. You've done already some cool stuff that we're going to discuss today because um, you have uh, very difficult mountains to climb to take iconic watches like the Carrera and the Monaco and to marry that heritage into contemporary times. But maybe you could give a short intro about yourself, please. Um, as you said, I don't like to talk about myself too much, but uh, um, how can we say? Let's say that I'm, uh, well, I'm approaching my uh, fifth decade of life. Uh, I spent the last about 25 years of that working in the watch industry. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you want to hear about me. Uh, but, well, let me uh, share your passions, who you are, your background. You have a very British accent, very uncertain. I, I grew up in uh, England until the time I was about 10. Yeah. And then we moved uh, very near here, about 10 minutes away, where I spent the rest of... Uh, my childhood. Um, then I went away to college in California uh -huh. uh, and came back, went back there again, came back and uh, started working in the watch industry. I think this was in 96 or 97, uh, so nearly 25 years. Um, what I what I really like when I'm, when I'm not uh, in the office is uh, uh, photography. Uh, architecture, actually designing spaces. Uh, I don't, I don't go through architecture books. I, I like to actually design spaces. I like to take pictures. I don't like to look at pictures. Um, so, if it wasn't design, it might well have been in those fields. But it uh, happened to be design. So uh, very nice. So I actually couldn't find you on Instagram. What is your handle? Uh, I have to. Let me just look and uh, yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, look it up because I wanted to tag you and I couldn't find you because there are several Guy Boves. Ah, yeah, yeah, but there's only one that uh, that interests us today, and I I wish I knew what my handle was. Uh, I'll have to I'll have to come back to you on that, honestly. Okay, okay. It's Let not, me know. I want to put it. I'm very curious to see your pictures. Ah, uh, you're not going to find too many in there. Uh, you know, as you mentioned at the beginning of this, I don't like to talk about myself too much. So you might have to come have a coffee at home one day and then I can show you hundreds of thousands of pictures. I would be honored. I will be honored. Uh, talking about uh, watchmakers making photographs, um, you know, uh, Petros from Omega? Yes. He makes stunning pictures with his hustle, right? Have you seen them? I have not seen them, but, I, but I've heard about that. Check it out. So this is a shout out to our friend uh, Petros. Anyways, thank you so much. For the introductions it's a tradition on this show to start off with a wrist check what are you <laughs> wearing today Guy? today i'm wearing let's see if i can turn my wrist the right way around i'm yeah. wearing one of our new carreras and i just have to find my camera yeah. so i'm wearing one of our new carreras that i think we'll be talking about uh in a little bit so yeah. this is um it's a, a car we just launched with our hoyer 02 movement inside 
uh, and it's really um, it's sort of the model that we're using to take a close look at the DNA of the Carrera range going forward. And so there's a lot of, uh, I would say there's a lot of things that are, um, people who have uh, been watching our career since the 1960s will recognize immediately. And there's a, oh, thank you very much. Much better picture than I was able to do here. Thank you, Dan. Uh, exactly. So there's a, lo there's a lot of uh, things from the past and there's a lot of things, I would say, from the future in there as well. So if we have a bit of time, I'll take you through them. No, definitely. So I definitely want to talk about because this is the this is the 2020 Carrera Classic. You guys also launched simultaneous or a bit later the sports version. So I definitely want to talk about that. Um, so amazing, thank you. I grabbed two Tag Heuer's for my private collection. Since we're on topic of the Carrera, I grabbed a early oh, 70s Carrera. Um, it's not a caliber 11, it's based on the caliber 11 with 12, yeah. um, but with the crown on the other side. I love this piece. And those that say that Carreras are thick nowadays, just look at this sitting on my wrist. So the belly of the beast. And I have my 9098 first re edition Monaco limited edition. So this is the in first time. That Tag Hoyer brought back the Hoyer on the modern version. So um, I saved up for that. And the funny story is um, the first real time piece I bought for myself, I saved up for it. I was working holidays after I collected swatches, it was actually the small Formula One in 34 millimeters. So I have a deep passion for Tag Hoyer and Hoyer. So I'm very honored to, to talk to you guys today. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Before we do a deep dive into what you do, the creative process, designing watches, the Carrera especially, um, it's also a tradition to uh, ask you seven D Ace List questions. So the first one, Guy, what watch or jewel is your favorite and why? Um, well, first of all, it would be more of a watch than a jewel. Um, I have a, I have a, I can't really say what my favorite watch is because I have, I have a lot of them, um, some from brands that I worked for, some for brands I haven't worked for. One of the things that I really like about watches um, are, um, is when the whole thing really comes together and you have more than the sum of the components um, and, and where everything seems to be designed but it also seems to be effortless mm -hmm. and uh and uh, actually it's uh one of the reasons i'm wearing this watch um and that i'm actually honored to answer this question is um one of my favorite watches and I'm, I'm not going to lie to you and say there's only one but one of my favorite ones uh is actually the 1963 carrera which um, which is uh, which brought a, really a lot of uh, information to the design of this watch, uh -huh. and that watch for me uh, really really um, does all that. It's it's uh, you can tell that everything uh, was designed to be exactly that way, but it doesn't look over designed. It looks like uh, it looks like. Um, uh, it looks effortless and. Uh, Anyway, uh, let me. Yes, one of my favorite chronographs ever. Exactly. So, so not my own, but uh, I'm fortunate that I don't have to own these pieces to look at them. Um, but uh, so, so this is one of those watches. And uh, even though, I mean, what's really cool about this watch is when you see it in pictures. I'll try to get it back. It looks huge. Uh, I'm just going to put it up against uh, yeah. a new one. So uh, let's see. Yeah, so you yeah, can see that it's really not uh, not at all in the same size league, but uh, you can see when you when you see it in pictures and when you look at the details that uh, that it really is uh, bigger than the sum of the of its parts. Nicely said. So I had the honor to meet Mr. Jack Hoyer on several occasions in all these years that we've been retelling Tag Hoyer, which is since the early seventies. Um, I also spoke about him 
with him that he designed in the early 60s. He was an avid racer himself. He loved races. Hoyer is known for stopwatches, dashboard stopwatches, and he translated that into also wristwatches. Um, a lot of people get confused with the Carrera car by another famous manufacturer. It was named after the Pan America Carrera race in Latin America, which was a rally. He really designed a watch in, 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 in keeping those races in mind. I also read his autobiography. Um, I love the style, the simplicity, and you said it very eloquently. It's, it's the sum of all those details that, that makes it very well balanced. And I think you guys did an excellent uh, execution on this year's uh, novelty or evolution. Um, which also, I found it actually very interesting that you guys, is the first time you advertise with the car that has the same name. Because that was never done before. So, and which so that was born, uh, born the same year as well. Same, born same year. And which is very interesting that the car yeah. is a icon as well, which has very strong pedigree and evolves. It's never a revolution. And although you guys did do some revolutions the, the the classical chrono is a nice evolution and i want to talk a bit later about that how it is for you to work as a designer on that but thank you so much for answering the first question the second question is what did you want to be when you grew up um a few things uh one of them is uh which is a, i think is quite typical is a either a cowboy or an indian um either uh, or <laughs> i think it depended on the days back then <laughs> um since i was little i i used to build things um all kinds of things i have pictures of you know when i was two or three when i was practicing using hammers and, and screwdrivers and things like that and so i think the idea of creating objects has never been far from my mind um, but uh, so after I after I decided uh, that I wasn't going to be a cowboy, um, I uh, I thought about being a rock star. But but my music lessons didn't didn't carry me far enough to do that. Um, and of course, I'm uh, I don't like to be on stage that much, so also not a good option. Um, I like to build things, so I thought. Uh, what you had to do to build things was um, get training in engineering. And uh, I did set out to do that. That was uh, my first, uh, the first, my first studies in California. Uh -huh. um, after about two semesters of that, I decided that uh, that also was not going to be how I was going to create objects. Uh, but I did start taking fine art classes, so I have some training uh, in painting as well. Uh -huh. um, but then I, uh, but then I um, did some looking around, and I decided that if you want to design objects, a good thing to do is to study design. Uh -huh. And so finally, uh, these different things led me to design school, uh, second time in California, and uh, and that's when I knew that I was going to work as a designer. Nice, nice. And um, could we, just an intermezzo and bonus question. Could we, I always say that um, watches and jewelry are little sculptures, architectural structures, yeah. especially watches because you need the architecture of the movements. It's always a battle between design and watchmaking, the design yeah. of calibers and building calibers. Uh, would you say that you're basically are an architect when you design watches? I, I would say, I mean, one of the, um, uh, yes, I mean, I would say to a large extent, yes, I'm an architect of space, and it doesn't necessarily matter whether it's an interior space, an outside space, um, or a watch. Um, I mean, uh, in in the course of uh, my career in, in watches, um, more than designing watches, I've I've uh, I've worked a lot on brands, watch brands, and in the course of that, I've spent a lot of time working on uh, interior spaces yeah. for brands uh, in the form of the boutiques, yeah. uh, but also in the trade uh, the trade uh, marketing materials. You've probably got a few displays um, of ours uh, 
near you. And so I worked a lot on those kind of things. And it really doesn't matter to me what it is that I'm working on. It's really proportions, it's colors, it's materials, yeah. um, how things fit together, how they how they talk about the brand, um, yeah. you know, how they take talk to the customer. So yes, it's it's all either architecture as proportions or proportions or architecture, but for sure there's a link in there. Interesting. So you actually really take a helicopter view on the word of designing and creative processes. That's interesting yeah. to hear. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Third question, who is or was your role model? Um, I, I wouldn't pick a person, I think. I would pick... Uh, I don't know. I would say maybe there's two kinds of people that uh, that I would uh, look up to. One one uh, might be um, people who you know some you meet some people and uh, and they can see through the clutter. They they know where it is they need to get to. Might take five years. Might take, might take ten years, twenty years. But I uh, but I. Um, I admire that sort that sort of uh, focus and and vision, which is not easy to do because it means you know it means uh, I mean you see something a long way away, but then there's all the steps you have to take to get there. Uh, there's things like COVID that come and sort of you know get in the middle of things. There's uh, you know there's heartache, there's uh, joy, there's all kinds of stuff. So anyway, the people who can see through all that. And manage to get to get whatever it is they're doing to that level. I think is uh, quite inspiring. And then there's people who um, who are able and willing to put their talent to use for the greater good. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So I mean, those those are the kind of people that inspire me. It's it's not so much one person or another. I get it. And. If I'm forcing or twisting your arm to mention a few designers that 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 either inspired you or you looked up to, or while you were coming up as a uh, design student, who 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 influenced you, or who did you admire? Um, I, I mean, you have to realize that uh, these uh, these years that you're talking about were quite a long time ago. Um, yeah, right. Uh, so I have to let me just think for a second, but uh, but I we think, live in an age of retro, right? So uh, it's still very, 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 very yeah, I'm not, I prefer to think about neo retro, but we can be in the yeah. age of retro if, if you like. But uh, I mean, I, I would say, uh, I mean, have, you have to remember back there, and I didn't not only I would say know about watches, but I didn't really care about watches. I was uh, I was more into design and uh, you know architecture. Yeah, and you can. Uh, but uh, but I th I would say um, uh, Baragon, for example, in architecture. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, uh, Saarinen and some people like that in furniture, yeah. uh, and also architecture. Um, you know, pe people like that. But I think it's uh, I think it's uh, it sort of comes back to that idea of um, you know. Designs that look effortless, but you know there's a lot of work behind them, uh, more than the sum of the components. You know, mm -hmm. it's pe people who can do that quite well and still create something new and inspiring. Mm -hmm. if, of course, you can do all that and, and be a copy of, of something, you know, uh, from the past. But I think to move something forward and still do all that uh, and, and to come up with something that looks like it's going to look great in 10 years or 20 years, that's, uh, that's who inspires me. Well said. Well said. Um, and just to see, um, obviously, I'm very tainted because I'm Dutch. Uh, furniture, I am uh, talking about old school designs, really like Rietveld. And uh, modern architects, I really love Rem Kohas. What's your view on, yeah. on these style of designers and architects? Is that something um, that, that when you were growing up in Switzerland and studying in the U.S. that was on the radar, or was that very European or Northern European? No, I was. Uh, in fact, I started design school here in Switzerland, and, and most of the instructors were European. So, so I I did. Uh, I mean, I grew up uh, looking at that kind of stuff. Um, Interesting. I know where you're coming right. from. Yeah. Thank you. Fourth question: If you could teleport tomorrow, where would you go? How far? 
You choose. You can go to the moon or further. Uh, there's a there's a couple. Uh, well, I, mean, I have a sort of bucket list with a few places that I haven't crossed off. Uh, yeah. Quite a few places. Uh, one of them is uh, is a bit too late, but if I could teleport myself, that could be an interesting one. Is um, when I was uh, going through uh, college, uh, at least in the beginning of college, uh, I was planning at some point to take a motorcycle um, ride across the USSR. And so that would take a bit of teleportation to happen today. I mean, be, yeah. I'd be riding through a lot of different republics today. But uh, So what would you do? Would you do the Silk Route or would you take the Northern Route? I would I would take um, probably a motorcycle made by BMW and take my own route. Nice, nice. That's a cool so, one. So yeah. Otherwise, I would be happy to get out of here for in uh, you know, a couple of weeks and go dive in the Andamans or something like that. But yeah. also nice. So you're you drive motorcycles, I assume. Uh, no, that was the other thing. Is I don't have the motorcycle license, so that, you know. uh, so so first we need to get the license. First, I would go to the DMV and then to Russia. No. But then again, in those days, I don't think you needed a license. Just a bit of ruble a passport. passport. I didn't. Right. I didn't have that problem back then. Yeah, good one. Uh, what book are you currently reading? Um. Uh, one of the things about me is I read really, really fast. So. Currently, reading is normally about two hours of time. So I, I could say one of the things which I found enjoyable, which I read recently, mm -hmm. um, is a book called The uh, Primate's Memoir mm -hmm. by uh, Robert Sapolsky, I think his name is. And, uh, mm -hmm. it's a very funny, fascinating um, book about baboons in Kenya. Okay. Uh, it's a guy who followed uh, a baboon colony for about uh, two decades, and uh, and it's uh, really one of the funniest books I've ever read, but also one of the deepest books I've ever read. So well worth reading. A primate's memoir. Yeah. This is. Uh, the but I uh, I also read a lot of uh, Nordic uh, noir. They you know as they call it Joe Nesbo and so on. So that's more my everyday reading. Interesting. Thank you. Sixth question. <laughs> what is going to be the color of 2021? From, from what I've been looking at, uh, there's going to be more than one. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that I like um, on a personal level are, I would say, a sort of... Um, not pastel, but a soft uh, shade of uh, military green and also mm -hmm. a soft shade of orange. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like orange is going to be a wide range in color, I think going from a sort of off mustard to a, to a dark mango. So we'll have to see exactly which is the color amongst those. But I think- That's, uh, that's good news for us, us, us Dutchies. We love orange. <laughs> exactly. So. My, I would say my favorite ones next year. It looks like uh, it looks like there might be um, uh, also sort of a uh, gray blue, uh, which I like as well. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there's lots of other colors, but uh, I think in the gray blue, of, would you call that ardoise or no? That's a bit of no. Charcoal. It's more blue than that. Okay. More blue and lighter than ardoise. Ardoise okay. would be a charcoal gray, but uh, so yeah. slate gray. But yeah. I would say more blue than that. Nice. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that there won't be ardoise as well. I will have to see. And uh, could we conclude? Oh, well, sure, yeah. we our words will be in next year. That's for sure. Yeah, I love that one. And could we conclude that this year was all about green and rainbows? Uh, this year, we I mean, we think green was pretty cool, uh, yeah. for sure. Yeah, um, that was my favorite, actually, this uh, year. It's an yeah, amazing very right? cool, uh, I don't know if you can see it anyway, very yeah. cool green that at least we thought it was very cool. Well, we um, think it's cool as well. We we, ha right. we had it in stock. We sold it. We have it back in stock. I love that dial. So okay. I know it's a great dial. It's, it's, it's a very unusual green. Yeah. Um, what would you call that green, Guy? I was just looking at it to, to define it. 
um, because it really goes from an olive through a metallic through a military through racing green so it's a really super cool green i um, used a bit of emerald green even colombian emerald green. Yeah, it's got more it's got a bit more yellow in it than emerald so it's a, okay. it's a very very interesting green and we were very excited to find it yeah stunning great job so thank you for that last question have you been to amsterdam before and what's your favorite memory if you have that's a, at least that's an easy one. Thank you. Um, thank you for the last one. Uh, I have been to Amsterdam before, uh, quite a while ago as well. It must have been 2004 or something. Um, so my memories are not 100% clear, but I do remember, um, I love the water, and, and uh, I do remember my boat trip down, I think, the uh, Prinsengacht. Mm hmm uh, and uh, the, it's a great combination. It's water and architecture, and it was really nice to see the old building, some of the newer ones that have come up in the middle of them and so on. So really very, very cool uh, architecture and a, a beautiful boat ride. Yeah, amazing. Awesome. So it's been 16 years. It's time you come back. It is time. This is another invitation. You're our guest. Please come again. So we want you in Amsterdam. And you'll be working with KLM to make that possible, I guess, in the next few weeks. Is that correct? KLM is definitely going to survive. The pilots, they surrendered. They fall in line. So we're all good. Excellent. All Excellent. good. All good. We still have Swiss, so all, all is fine. Um, so all kidding aside, I have, I have a lot of questions for you. Our viewers are posting a lot of comments. I try to keep this session below one hour, which is difficult for me. Um, I want to go back to the Carreras, if that's okay with you. Okay, fine. Because I'm very subjective. I love that watch. I think it's really out there with the most iconic chronographs ever, the Speedmaster with the Navi timer. Um, the Carrera is there for me. Some would put the Daytona there. That's a decision. I'm, I'm not always there. Um, how was it for you? to work on such a design that, that it, as you said yourself, you, you actually took the words out of my mouth that uh, it was some of all components and it was already very good. So could you maybe elaborate a bit on that and about the design process of creating that current two models? Cause you, you created a fork basically. Uh, yeah. So we've got both of them right here so we can yeah. talk about the sport and yeah. the like so for um, those of you that don't know, the classic doesn't really have a lunette, a bezel, and the sporty model has a bezel, fixed bezel, which is a tachymeter, a speedometer, let's say, right. and uh, you either have it ceramic or full steel. So th that is the fork in the design. Both have the OA02 caliber, so that's in-house, made by Tegoria, designed by Tegoria, made right. in-house. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Guy, just an intermezzo. A lot of people get confused about the 1887 caliber. That movement was made very briefly based on an existing design by Tag Heuer. It got pushed out. You guys went back to the drawing board before you joined Tag Heuer. It was dipped the CH80 caliber, if I'm not mistaken, exactly. because it had a power reserve of around 80 hours uh, charged. And that evolved into the O2, which is a platform for your tourbillon. So it's the O2T. You use it in this caliber. It's very robust. It's resilient. It has good power reserve. I believe it's around 70 plus now. It's 80 hours. 80 hours. Yeah. So it's based on the CH80. Um, so I, I don't want any discussions or confusion there. It has nothing to do with the 1887, right? Not, Column not wheel? Related. No. Column not wheel? Back. It's, a, uh, it's an entirely new movement. Yeah. Um, like you said, very resilient, uh, quite thin. It's uh, yeah. it's about a millimeter thinner than than the movements that you common, commonly see in the industry, but with a much better power reserve, about twice the length of time. Yeah. So uh, excellent engineering. Um, uh, so did you start off designing the process based on these parameters? That's the caliber, x amount of lines diameter thickness etc and did you start from there yeah. on this project what the, what the the starting point was um 
we've we already used the Hoyer 02 in the Carrera collection in the skeleton versions. Yeah. Um, the idea here was to uh, take this caliber and use it in our uh, let's say our more timeless uh, exactly. So this is the caliber. Yeah. Uh, Stunning art. Yeah, with a um, uh, a gold colored winding rotor um, to to emphasize the the I would say the homemade home designed uh, movement. Um, what we wanted to do was to, of course, we had it in the skeleton watches, but what we really wanted to do was bring it into our uh, into the core uh, Carrera DNA. Um, which was, which is, which has been over the uh, over the last decades more in line with the uh, very first 1963 model that I showed you earlier. Um, so we wanted to to bring that more in line, and we and we uh, clearly used that opportunity to visit uh, or revisit the DNA of the of the collection and create some design details, which which will be. Part of our DNA moving forward, and um, and we talked about a, a certain car earlier, which uh, which um, you know which continuously evolves. And basically, what we've done now with the with the Tag Heuer Carrera is uh, is bring in some some new DNA, which is which is based on on our on our previous models and our historical models, uh, and take it forward for the next uh, you know couple of years or decade. Um, which will let us uh, play around with these details, play around with different dials and cases to to uh, carry the Carrera collection forward into the future. Uh, one of the, maybe a quick example, uh, I don't know if I can show you on this uh, thing, is yeah. you can see in the new watch um, that, that the design of the case goes from one horn all the way around to the other horn, which is something that we've never done previously uh, in shit, where is this? in uh, in Carrera, you can see that we have a more fluid look to the watch. Nice. Um, you can there are some tiny details. Uh, oh yeah, that's a great picture. Uh, you can see some details, even like the the end of the horns is angled. Um, it slopes further outward so that the so that your eye really catches the tip of the horn. Um, follows through the whole case, and it gives it a more, I would say, a more speedy, more fluid, a uh, bit more contemporary look. But if you look at the watch from the front, it's 100% Carrera, and uh, you know it really carries off uh, where the 1963, you know, to to 1969 models left off. So, so there's a lot of the past, uh, but it is taken forward. Uh, if you look at the dial, there's all kinds of new details. If you look at the um, markers, yeah. Again, from the front, they're very close to the 1963 markers, but if you start looking at them in 3D, they're they're very different, and uh, they really are designed to catch the light from all the different angles. Um, they're sloped inwards so that if you look at the if you turn the watch, you'll see the light playing around uh, on the markers in all the directions. So it so it makes the dial very vibrant, a uh, very 3D. Um, and, May uh, I jump uh, in here, Guy? Excuse me? May I jump in here? At, at Please do. Marker, yeah, on the top of a markers, if I'm not mistaken, you design fonts, right? Especially also, Arabic numerals. I, I've known, exactly. I, I, I love fonts, and I know you do too. And there are not many designers that actually create fonts from scratch. You now did basically indexes which are numerals for a watch they, they also the numerals the number. Number. and there's also the numerals on the watch which are new the what the numerals are also new yeah so you designed that what i wanted to ask is twofold on these indexes i get a bit of japanese vibe the japanese spend a lot of time on angles and polishing the swiss do too on calibers have you ever worked with Japanese? Because I get a bit of a Japanese vibe of technique, yeah? Of, of, of dedication, of attention to details, because I've never seen such detailed indexes at this price point, yeah? I, I don't want to uh, offend any ultra-hotologerie brand that have the time and budget to do that. But 
for this price point, I think it's amazing the, the level of detailing you guys did. Also on the bracelet, the metal bracelet. Yeah, this, this bracelet um, is based on our, on our, on our uh, existing and previous Carrera bracelets, but it's uh, the thing about the Carrera watch are the, the cutouts on the inside of the lugs, the triangular cutouts, which make the lugs very thin, very elegant, um, very, uh, I would say, sort of um, very pure, very mechanical. Um, mm -hmm. But to emphasize these cutouts, what we did was we worked on the on the strap, which is still yeah. recognizable. It's still in line with the other Carrera straps, but it's designed to be more fluid and uh, and less noticeable. And to leave uh, and to I would say put a focus attention on the 3D look of the of the lugs themselves. So so you can see. I mean, it's a, it's very much a Carrera strap. There's a yeah. lot of work bezels in there. You can see that we have bezels which are even hidden. Uh, under the H shapes, you can see the yeah. the links, the central links, yeah. have facets which are hidden underneath the H shapes to make the watch flow, but still create points of light, um, flashes of light on the strap. But once you get up towards the case, they, um, the strap sort of disappears into the case and it lets the case shine. Yeah, so that was the, the idea behind this. Beautiful. So another question I had for you, when you start coming up with an idea or a sketch, do you start off with by hand pencil or pen, or do you immediately use digital tools or how is your designing process? Uh, a lot of, a uh, lot of sketching, um, uh, a lot of sketching and, and not necessarily precise sketching. The idea is really, uh, at least for me is really to, um, to figure out uh, the direction uh, that the product is going to go in. Uh, it's to get as many ideas as possible uh, in a short amount of time. I mean, I'm just going to show you these really quickly. There's, yeah. They're not coming out or anything, but it's just, uh, it's just to give you an idea. Uh, and then, um, personally, I will move to the computer quite quickly uh, after that to, to be able to put the movement inside and actually work on a, on a solid base which is going to be very close to what we'll be able to make at the end. And then in that 3D model, I'm going to be combine, combining ideas from the sketches. But the sketches themselves, are, I'm really not someone who's very good at, um, I don't know whether I'm good at it or not, but it's not something that I focus on, um, is to design, to draw exactly what's going to be there. It's really, I really use drawing as a way to, to get ideas. So, so that's how I work, and then I go to the computer and I work in 3D so that I can... I can uh, one of the things I talked about photography is uh, when I work on a watch, I'm also looking at it, thinking how is the picture of this watch going to look? And so by working in 3D, I can play, I can see how light is going to react on the surfaces. I can see how, how, how curved to make them, how much angle to give them and so on so that the watch works well uh, in photos. Amazing. So I have loads of questions. I know our viewers too. I just want to ask you one that, that is on top of my mind. And then I, I want to go into the viewers questions. How do you find the inspiration, but also the pulse of current day? What do I mean by that? The What consumers like today? So how did you find the inspiration that the Carrera today needs to be more fluid, that that bracelet needs to be more fluid. And so so my question is too, for where do you find the inspiration and where do you do market research? That's basically what I'm asking you. Um, my inspiration typically, at least on, on uh, the products, um, yeah. whatever I do within a watch, within a, you know the, the brand um, is, um, it's heavily based on the brand itself. Mm -hmm. um, the stuff that comes out of the mu museum for sure, but also what does the brand stand for? Um, you, I mean, we're, for example, we're not a, an especially um, backward looking brand. Um, yeah. We have avant garde as part of our DNA. Yeah. Uh, we have. Um, 
racing as part of our DNA. We've got technical sports as part of our DNA. So, so uh, when we're talking about um, you know this fluidity, uh, I'm looking, I'm looking at a, uh, you know, how can the watch be perhaps a little bit more aggressive? How could it be? How could it look a little bit faster? Uh, how can it live up to its name? Uh, Carrera, you know, uh, the Carrera part of the Panamericana means race in Spanish. So how do we bring that feeling across into the watch? Mm-hmm. Um, how can we take these markers from 1963, which were used throughout the 60s and part of the 70s by Hoyer, how can we take them forward, um, maybe help, the, help our customer read the time uh, in 3D, how can we bring a bit of sparkle to the watch and still keep this, the, you know, keep uh, our heritage intact uh, from the front? Basically, it looks like a 1963 Carrera, but but in fact, as soon as you start looking at the watch, there's nothing there that's the same. So so there's all that part of it. Uh, then uh, then there's a uh, how does the market um, react well luckily fairly positively uh which is which is always nice when you bring out a new range um i think um i think what what's uh, nice about these pieces and what we try to do every day is to um bring uh bring what we know how to do to the customer who's looking for something a little bit different from from other watches on the market and what we can bring to the table and uh, i think to to the customer is that a uh, you know perhaps moving forward mentality um the this i this maybe a bit more of a technical look a more sporting look mm-hmm. uh, maybe a more modern look mm-hmm. um uh, on the same tray as uh, as uh, you know watches that are similar to this and uh, so uh hopefully the customer is uh you know is uh, is following us but that's uh, i think um whatever we do we have to be tag hoyer yeah amazing uh, we don't have to be, yeah. we don't have to be me we don't have to be you know the designers working on it we don't have to be uh something else but we do have to be tag hoyer definitely and you guys i think feel very much the, the the pulse of the market and the segments especially also we didn't even talk about the connected were yeah. you already on board for the third generation that's now out there uh very late in the game because i think that's 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 i think is the most beautiful connected watch out there it's an amazing improvement of the first two generations which were cool and fun the modular concept was fun but they were a bit chunky i call them they were the defenders of watchmaking. Uh, the Defender yeah. car is so cubistic and ugly that it's beautiful. And that's yeah. what I loved about the first two generations. But the third generation, the current connection is, is truly a Carrera. So I salute you guys on that. Maybe that's an, uh, we can do a future session. I would love to because I see we're running already towards three quarters of an hour. Um, before I ask my colleague Dala to uh, help me out, Guy, I would love you to find your Instagram handle please <laughs> there's not really not a, much, you want to really do not point in going there um because i don't use it um <laughs> so i think the community is gonna now gonna push you to post more because i think a lot of us would love to see things off your hand sketches photographs so Gee, this is a this is a nudge to motivate yeah. you to post dada do you want to do the comments or should i do them uh, okay, I, cool. I think uh, I think uh, your viewers are going to have to uh, PM me and get in touch because I I'm I'm not uh, inclined to. I will uh, I will talk to you afterwards backstage. Okay, so first question for our viewers, from our viewers, Gerard Nayem brings on Facebook writes and he's a huge watch collector and he writes also for FratelloWatches.com, friend of the show. Um, Guy, were you responsible for the design of the 2020 Tag Hoy Formula One item Senna as well? Um, that was designed uh, by someone in my team. Uh, so it depends on what you call responsible, but it's either my fault or my. Uh, <laughs> so or my I guy. Yeah, so I don't know if Gerard is going that direction. I think last year was the first time ever that we've seen the marriage between two models, the Formula One, 
with the link bracelet, which originated in the SEL collection back in the day, one of my favorite metal bracelets ever together with the rouleau. And was this a huge discussion in your teams to marry those two collections? Because obviously the market really wanted this. What, um, the, it was actually used before my arrival in a previous one. Correct. Uh, and it's something well, that we did, we did discuss for this, for this series of watches. Um, and this series of watches is, is, a uh, is, a uh, um, is is really sort of a, a cornerstone for for the uh, collaboration with Senna going forward, and um, uh, we decided to actually make it a clear part of the Senna DNA on the F1 collection. So um, it's a clear decision to use it going forward, and uh, the reason for that is uh, I don't know whether you know this, but uh, Senna himself wore the SEL Bruno. You know, back in the day, and uh, and so that was a very clear, you know, uh, remembrance of uh, of his yeah. talent. Because yeah. um, I remember it as a kid, I loved Formula One, and we were retelling Hoyer when he was still alive and wearing it. And he, I believe, he loved the chrono quartz with one yes. link and the leather strap the most. That yes, was exactly he was wearing most of the time. And for those that don't remember or do remember, I highly recommend to watch the documentary on Netflix about his life. And you'll see a lot of Hoyer and Tag Hoyer there. And uh, yeah. actually, Hoyer became TAG Hoyer then, so Technique Avant Garde, um, where, which married Hoyer. Um, so there's a clear storytelling for doing that. So thank you for answering that. I hope that answers your question, Girard. Yeah, that's the watch. Thank you, Dale. So this is, this is the watch I associate with Senna. Uh, yeah. Next question, please. Watch for Rocky, also a big collector. He has a whole crew of watch collectors in Amsterdam called the Watch 4 Crew. He writes on YouTube, nice green Carrera cal caliber HO2. Um, he asks, why does this one do doesn't have a green ceramic bezel like the bl blue and black version? And has it a steel bezel? Good question, Rocky. It's a it's a good question. Um, we, I mean, one of the reasons is that... Uh, uh, clearly, not everybody likes the um, likes ceramic. Uh, the other one is um, we wanted to. I mean, uh, this uh, this watch here that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, it has a more of a I would say a more of a classic look uh, to it, and even though it's um, it's sporty, doesn't necessarily mean that it that it. Um, I mean, it's sporty because it's got the wide bezel and tachymeter, but we did want to we did want to have uh, a piece uh, for sure in the in the this year and going forward with the steel bezel. Uh, it's also um, uh, we will keep the steel bezel in the collection, and it can open the doors to other colors as well, where we don't necessarily uh, want or need to have a ceramic bezel. So it's a it's a uh, some people really like the look of the steel bezel, and in fact, I'm one of them. Um, and so it's it's a uh, it's uh, I would say it's an ex it's um, an expanded part of the of the collection. So it's uh, it is uh, clearly it's also slightly less expensive than the uh, than the uh, ceramic bezels. So it's uh, I mean it's it's really not enough to make a difference, but it is an entry uh, point into the uh, sport range. Um, and it's also a slightly more classical take on this uh, on this sport model. Excellent, great question. Because for those that don't know, which is cool, which Tech Hoy does quite some time, they make a limited time models like the green one. It's an Addis. They call it Addis additional. We used to and, call it the Addis. Uh, pardon? We used to call it the Addis. Not anymore. Yeah, that's that's uh, we. Uh, I mean, basically, it's a special edition, so it's it's yeah. not a. So you guys did that with the green aqua racer. You made a brown dial aqua racer. We get loads of requests for them. So I think you guys very much feel what's going on in the trend of uh, watch main collects. I saw in a picture that Dala just shared, and that's a question I have for you. Why did you guys decide to make the barrel of the pusher, so underneath the cap, a different color? Was it? Simply uh, on the, sorry, you mean the black section in the yeah. In the, Why would you do? Is it aluminium? 
Well, you can see, I mean, this is a good picture to show that, as you can see that it carries through the, the um, sort of racing stripe through the crown yeah. um, into the pushers. And that is one of the things that differentiates the sport model from the more elegant models. I get it. And it's, uh, so that's, uh, that's why it's there, just to make it more sporty. I get it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Dala, do we have more questions? Rocky again, who asks... How did Takeaway manage to produce a tourbillon watch below 20,000 euros retail? Uh, I would say, first of all, they're, um, let's say, compared to a lot of uh, brands who make movements, uh, we make a lot of we make a lot of them ourselves, and they're engineered to be to be. Um, reliable and to be made um, as a series they're not uh, they're not made uh, um, the same way that some that some other i mean they are made the same way they're screwed together and so on assembled but they they uh, for, for sure they're um, they're really designed to so that we can make more of them than most manufacturers i mean typically we might make a thousand tourbillon watches a year which is uh a lot yeah. of watches they're engineered from the ground up to do that and the other thing is they share a platform with our hoyo 02 movement mm -hmm. so rather than be a standalone tourbillon which is not connected to anything else and which has to be engineered uh to make a 1000 pieces a year they are part of a they're part of a hoyo 02 family where we make a lot of uh, our own movements so they can share a lot of vitals from that platform and for those that don't know this watch, it's amazing because when it was launched, it was a revolution in the watchmaking industry because it's a manufacturer caliber made in designed in house, made in house. It's a flying tourbillon in a chronograph. So that's basically two uh, complexities that are really difficult to manufacture. So I salute Tag Heuer for doing that. We always have one that's in stock in our boutique and maybe if I may add, there is another amazing Guy affiliated to Tag Heuer. Um, initially, I think before you arrived, there was Guy Sermon. He used to work primarily for Tag Heuer, but um, uh, Jean-Claude Biver obviously recognized his amazing talent and promoted him for the whole watchmaking department of the mother company. But he's still there, right? He's still uh, in the in the group, actually. He's still now yeah. he's working for the for the for the group and not only Tag Heuer. Yeah. Do you have direct access to him whenever you want? Uh, yes, when he was working only at Tag Heuer. Now, uh, less. Okay, amazing. Very, Thank very you. exciting, very exciting, very cool discussions. Yeah, I imagine. I can imagine. Amazing. Um, any more questions, Dala? Aryan Terlau asks on YouTube. I'd like to hear about the inspiration for designs. Does it come from watch-related issues or more broadly, like architecture, industrial design, et cetera? It, I would say uh, it, it comes from uh, maybe three things. I mean, one of them I talked about previously was uh, mm -hmm. the brand itself. Yeah. Um, one of them is uh, light, uh, telling time with light. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the other one is um, over the years, I've, I've built up quite a good understanding of how the different components of watches are made. And it's actually playing with the possibilities um, offered, you know, offered by modern manufacturing processes, which is one of the things that helps take our products um, towards the future. You mentioned earlier the detailing on the indexes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the reason that's possible in this price point, and uh, which would be difficult actually at any price point, is challenging the suppliers, mm -hmm. understanding you know how maybe they make other indexes or other parts of the watch, and applying that and asking them to challenge the way that they that they make our indexes. So that's where that comes from. I mean, it's a, you know maybe there's this idea that we. That we uh, exactly um, 
So uh, challenging, I mean, maybe there's an idea that uh, comes from the case here. You can see the different facets in the index and uh, they might be inspired by what's happening on the case itself so that we really have a continuous look and feel through the whole watch. So it's, it's I mean, in this case, we're talking about Carrera, we're talking about the play of light, we're talking about uh, manufacturing advances, and we're talking about what does the brand stand for. So I, what I also noticed, you gave Carrera a very prominent position on the dial. It's above the logo. Did you also redesign that font for the Carrera name or logo? On the, uh, the, the font which is used on the Carrera is the one which was typically used quite often back in the uh, old days. Uh -huh. um, you'll see it, for example, on, uh, on one of the uh, uses of the Monaco wording um, uh -huh. back in the, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have started to do is clearly uh, one of the recognizable things in the Hoyer days and in part of Tag Hoyer is having the, the collection name above the logo. Mm -hmm. And that's something that really put back in place in the Carrera and you, you'll see more of going forward in the brand. So one of the places that inspiration comes from is, is way back in the 60s. Nice. And uh, last question for me, and then I think we should slowly wrap it up. Was it a big discussion? Dal, if you can put that picture back up, please. The At the bottom of the dial, you guys added the 80 hours and Hoyer 02. Was that a huge discussion if it should be there or eliminated? Whereas I believe you're also less is more guy like me. No pun intended. I'm, a, I'm not a less is more guy. I'm a, I mean... You'd say less is more, but if that was the case, there's a lot of detail on this watch that wouldn't have happened. I'm I'm more inclined to say too little is not enough. Okay. Uh, so I, uh, I think it's important to have the right balance, but uh, you can see that it's not a, it's not a part of the watch signature or anything like that. But it is. Uh, I mean, it's actually a new way of putting text on the dial. Yeah. Um, you know, some, some brands might have a lot of lines of text on the dial. Yeah. And I thought it was information that was useful to have there. Uh, we don't say it anywhere else on the watch. Um, and it does bring that sort of technical look and a little bit more detail to the dial, but it's not a, it's not sitting in the middle of, a, I don't know, the chrono, you know, the, the chrono sub dial or something like that. It's uh, out of the way. It's there if you want it. Otherwise, yeah. it's just bring a little bit of feeling to the dial if you don't yeah. uh, care about it. Now, me, myself, is, there are two schools. Those that want less, 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 less. Those that love those five, six lines on a dial. Me personally here, I love it because as you said, you need to pay attention to notice it. And I call it a little smiley. So yes. it smiles at you. So I'm very happy. Guy, it, I... It, uh, it brings a lot of, uh, it brings a little bit of presence to the bottom of the dial because yeah. as you mentioned earlier, we do have the strong Carrera at 12 o'clock and the, and the logo. So yeah. it sort of balances that waiting. It counters it, yeah. Yeah. I want to thank you so, so, so much, Guy. I really, really enjoyed this talk. Um, I can go on for hours, and I really hope that in season two, I can re-invite you to do another session. Um, I know you'll be watching next week. Next week, we have uh, head of product development, Xavier Ligero of Longines, which yeah. also promises to be a fun talk. So definitely tune in next week at 2 p.m. Central European time. Guy, merci, merci beaucoup. Thank Great. you, Alon. Thank you for your time. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Me too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.